So I'd like to tell you a little bit about an experiment, an exciting adventure that I've had the opportunity to embark on with a bunch of friends and colleagues in this phenomenal place, uh, Roanoke and the Valley Areas. And I titled this talk, uh, Science Nerds, that would be me, I guess, one of these guys over here, here, business leaders, community folks, natural beauty of which it is abundant around here, if you haven't already noticed, and how we can affect local change and have global impact. So we had the opportunity uh, about two years ago to come here and be part of an experiment. And for those of you that have been in Roanoke a while, uh, you may recognize this picture. This is the uh, remnants of a football stadium. It used to be up the road. And the more people I've met in the community, the more things I've found out about what went on either in that stadium or under that stadium, as it might be. And apparently, a lot of, a lot of hearts were broken when it came down. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, some new things went up, and the new things that went up included this complex, which is a new medical center, medical school, research institute. And uh, this picture in the lower corner here is a building in which we are housed as of uh, September 2010. Uh, it's a building where we do research, and we do research that relates to human health and decision-making, uh, biomedical things, and so forth. And of course, many of you are from cities and places where this same kind of stuff goes on and we wanted to differentiate ourselves. We knew we weren't going to be able to compete on day one with institutions that have been around for 200 or 250 years or so. So we wanted to be special, we wanted to make a mark, and we wanted to tie into the community. So this is just a quick little rundown of, of some of the details of the, the organization. It's about a two-year-old organization, uh, about 100,000 square foot of workable space uh, in the Research Institute. The initial investment represented a public and private partnership from a health system here in the uh, Valley area, the uh, Carilion Health System, and a public state uh, university, Virginia Tech. And uh, they put in about $77.5 million to build the building. They threw in another $70 million to get the operations going. The private health system gave the land or, or leased the land at nominal cost to allow this to go forward. And we immediately went out and tried to hire, did hire, uh, 20 group or team leaders from all over the world to come in and focus on a couple areas. Uh, and then we hired a bunch of folks to work with them. We're up to about 150, 160 now. And of course, many of those folks uh, brought their partners with them, what we call spouses, houses, et cetera, and had their own impact on the community, people in professions, in the arts, et cetera. So net uh, about 250, 300 people from the Research Institute, a pretty rapid infusion in about a 24-month period in a, in a relatively constrained area here in South Roanoke, bringing in their careers and interests and their in culture and the arts as well as the sciences. And uh, these people brought money with them to do their work. We work on, on mostly federal research grants, so they brought about 40 grants with them. It's about a $12 million per year operation, about $30 million portfolio in hand. So that immediately infused funds into the community that hires other folks to work there, buys things, et cetera. So you could see pretty quickly um, some local, local impact. Uh, this is the little uh, rogues gallery of the, the group leaders we brought in from a variety of places. Don't worry, I won't go through them all. Um, but uh, just as a little highlight, uh, we brought in uh, a leader from University College London, uh, Rosalind uh, Moran, uh, people from the West Coast, California, Utah, from the D.C. area, uh, really from all over, the, all over the country. And a big contingent came from Texas. There was a bunch of us living in Houston in the time. And we thought this would be a great city for our families, ourselves, our careers, and we're really excited about the opportunity to do big science in a beautiful area in a welcoming community. And we very quickly learned how welcoming the community would be. And this is just a list of the places, uh, uh, various states and countries that our key investigators are from, just in terms of the international flavor. You see we have people from South America, North America, obviously, Europe, Asia, uh, etc. Uh, in the Mideast, uh, and from many of the states throughout the United States as shown here. So it's a very diverse group. Um, it's very interactive. Uh, that's what we tried to build, something that wasn't structured around a typical academic unit siloed structure, but where people interacted from all kinds of backgrounds. Their personal paths traveled and their particular expertise in the areas they worked in. So these were our goals. We wanted to become good at a couple things, really good at one or two things. Uh, had to get the right people. We definitely want it to be disruptive, but we want it to fit into this community and connect and not become an ivory tower, of course. Engage the community and get the community to buy in and share ownership, build diverse teams. Obviously, we need resources. Had to convince people from uh, politicians, uh, state leaders, local leaders, uh, private community business people, and so forth. 
We, we outlaw jargon in our institute. We do not let us talk to each other, ourselves, and our own little jargon. We force everybody in every discussion to assume everybody in the room knows little to nothing about what you're talking about, even when we're talking to 30 people who work on the same thing we work on, to force us to think outside of our little worlds. We celebrate and reward innovative failure. We emphasize failure. I know that sounds a little weird, but we like to have people trying bold things, and when they, re when they fail and they've really worked hard and come up with some what appeared to be great ideas that nobody could shoot a hole in, we reward that. And we certainly recognize success, but at all levels in our pipeline. So I'm going to tell you about one story, something we're focusing on, we want to be really good at. We're focusing on that little plastic uh, ball I threw out, the brain. We think the brain's a really cool thing. We think it's important. We think what is held within it is the future of the planet and the universe. War, love, passion, creativity, art, pain, just about everything we think of and live on a daily experience. And we think for too long, it has been only the province uh, moving from theology to philosophy to psychology, and it is time to really understand how it works, what we can do to optimize its performance, to help people where it's been hurt, and take it from me, for many of us it has been hurt, at least a quarter of the American population has a hurt brain, probably more than that. This statement here, taken from uh, gentleman Eric Kandel, a Nobel Prize laureate, uh, said the disorders that affect our brains, our nervous system taken together account for more hospitalizations, more care, and more chronic suffering than all other disorders combined. And that's true. We think it's important. Our groups study the brain different ways. We think of it as what we call wetware, the stuff of the brain. We have to figure out how it works. But we also think about the software and what's going on, how our brains operate and form memories and think about things and rationalize. So we need people with lots of different layers of expertise to really get at this. I'll show you a couple examples of the way we partner with the community to get at it. This is the work of my colleague, Craig Ramey. He ran a 40-year project called the Abbasidarian Project, where he studied children from birth uh, up into adulthood and looked at intensive interventions. I know you can't read this, but take it from me that the, or the orange colors here represent the performance uh, of the children over different ages that have been exposed to early interventions at all aspects of their life, nutrition, health, social interaction, education. And the uh, yellow uh, ones are the control groups. And this shows the same data plotted over 22 years of the children's life. Long story short, what Craig and his group has found working with educational systems uh, all around the country is very intensive early interventions giving children a chance at the first few years of life when you have the right mix can cause lasting changes in their life all the way through adulthood, and a little bit of investment early on is worth a heck of a lot later on. Most of us already know that. Here are the data. It works. It works all over the country, and we have to affect this change at the political level and take it out of the laboratories. Secondly, we have seen that brains, as I said, get hurt in all sorts of ways. And too often, societies simply walk away from that. And in this community, as other communities around the country, there are many people and many children who have had something that's affected their brain, and then you fall into a social services net, and that's it. The high-tech stuff is left for the other, the other cool things, I guess. So we have a group led by uh, Sharon Ramey who's developed a way to retrain the brain of children who have cerebral palsy, children who could walk in and not even open an arm to take a Velcro ball off a screen with an intensive intervention where we evaluate changes in the brain within three weeks, or taking the ball off and writing with the hand, et cetera. It's called constraint-induced movement therapy. It's now being used all over the world, and we have the central labs for that here. We have waiting lists from people all over the world who want to come here and be part of the project, and we're trying to expand that capability. And the health system and the community have been extremely helpful to, uh, to scale that up. Now, a little bit of technology. You've all heard about MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, taking pictures of your brain. This is the classic MRI, the one we're probably used to. You may have had your shoulder or knee looked at in an MRI. This would be Homer's brain with a regular structural uh, MRI. You see a picture of how it looks. This would be Homer's brain with another kind of MRI called fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which makes a movie, in essence, of the dynamic changes of activity and blood flow in our brain as we're thinking and doing things. This says sleep, donuts, sex, et cetera, defining the areas of Homer's brain. But we can use this in very powerful ways. OK, so this shows a little movie. I apologize. That it's a little hard to see. You're looking at a person's brain who's in a scanner. There are little lights flickering that you can't see showing the activity in the brain. And you see an arrow jumping around, and there's a little squiggly line here. So basically, this is a person sitting there thinking 
Different emotional states, thinking happy or sad thoughts, thinking in Mandarin or English, changing the syntax of the structure of their thoughts. And, and the programs that have been developed capture the overall activity pattern of the brain in real time and then feed it back either to the person to allow them to enhance the thought process or suppress the thought process like craving for drugs in the case of addiction, for example, and also drive the output to machines to move devices for people that can't move those devices. That's what's shown here, developed by our group of biomedical engineers working uh, with our community team. And if you could do a click on this one, a double click on the uh, picture if you could. Um, this is going to show another little trick our, our group has developed. Okay, you didn't hear the number one, but this is a picture of somebody sitting in a scanner and their, their tongue is moving and they're talking and it runs through a series of computer networks that reads the movement and decodes the sound. And so a person that's had a stroke, a child with a speech disorder, etc., you can feed right back in real time based on how they're trying to form a word and allow them to do something in hours in a scanner that for years they might have worked on in therapy and got maybe 20% of the way there. So we're very excited about applying these technologies to the community. But probably the biggest focus area we have is this one, led by uh, Reed Montague. Um, and it's, it's a way to really change the way the world thinks about what goes wrong with brains. And he's, he's really revolutionized the whole field, the field of medicine and science. Uh, I don't know if there's any psychiatrists in the audience. Are there? If there are, raise your hand. Okay, good, I can say bad things about psychiatrists. So psychiatry basically is a, a discipline that has been trying to catch up with science and the rest of medicine for a long time. And so it's time to move it into the 21st century. So Reed Montague and his group have invented a new field. It's called computational psychiatry, big word, but it simply takes mathematics and computation and analyzes precisely the pattern of activity in the brain and then plugs that back in to show us disease and brain malfunction. And this field is revolutionizing how we look at what's called social cognition. So in order to do that, we had to build something big. We had to go global. So we decided to build here in Roanoke the hub of the worldwide functionally interactive brain imaging network. And what we've done is put a bunch of scanners in here in Roanoke and up the street in Blacksburg. These are MRIs. And we developed, our group led by Reed Montague developed software. And we are now tied into China, Korea, uh, England, Norway, Germany, up and down the east and the west coast of the United States. So on any given night running out of Roanoke here, we're running scanners all over the world. And we're interacting with those scanners and have people participating in games while they're in the scanner, making decisions to understand how decisions are made by bankers, stock market investors, politicians, as well as just regular folk and people that have things happen where you have a disease like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or autism spectrum disorder in children, et cetera. The list goes on and on. And the group has uh, developed this into what we call the Roanoke Brain Study. And the community has been incredible. People are just coming in the doors. We can't keep up with the community support who want to participate. What do they get? They get 20 bucks, a slice of pizza, and a CD with a picture of their brain. Okay, what they're really getting, though, is a piece of the future and in investing in what we're going to learn in the world's largest study ever of understanding how the brain makes decisions as we develop various stages of life and how various things affect our brains. So this is developing into a large-scale project. It'll go on after we're gone. We hope it'll be a, a 30 or 40-year project. And uh, one of the areas that's already come out of it is from the Roanoke Brain Study is very interesting insights into autism spectrum disorder. And this group has already found the first functional deficit in the brain of children with autism spectrum disorder. It's not a cure for anything, but they have found where it is, what's wrong, and it's fascinating. This technology of letting people interact with each other has shown what goes wrong is the area of the brain that lets us determine if something we do with another person is due to us or them, what we call the self and other response. And that area of the brain in children with autism is flipped functionally, so they attribute something they've done to something you've just done, and vice versa, and it confuses their social interaction. We can see it behaviorally, but now we can see it in the brain, we can measure it, and if somebody thinks they have a way to fix it, prove it, show us. Don't rely on a questionnaire, let's see it, and let's make sure what people are investing in is really doing the right thing for these children by turning this into science for our children. <clears throat> and the next area is very interesting to us, and it is here in this area is around the country is substance abuse and addiction and how we make decisions. So much of what goes into healthcare costs these days is due to bad decisions by us, whether it's our dietary habits, our exercise habits, rest, um, uh, putting things in our body that our bodies don't like, et cetera. 
And so we have a group led by uh, Dr. Warren Bickle that studies how our brains measure the value of the future, how we discount the future. And he's using that to give feedback to these patients, using the brain scanning technology as well, to train them to have their brain value the future more. And to give you an example of how dramatic this is, and you're just sort of average everyday person, what you're, we call your discounting function of the brain is about four and a half years. After that time, there's very little value to things as you make decisions. If you're a heroin addict, it's nine days. Your world ends cold in nine days. Nothing has any value after that. If you smoke, it's about two years. And if we could transport some of this stuff out of the, the health aspect into other areas of decision making, such as political decision making, and how we value things into the future versus only the next election cycle, by understanding this, we think we'll be able to really add something important uh, to the community. And then the last little, little uh, data slide I'm going to show you here, these are pictures of brains of doctors, physicians. We decided, well, we need to turn this around. We need to use this technology and see how the people hold our lives in their hands and make decisions about our health and spend our money and break the economy in many cases are making those decisions and are they making them right? And what came out of this is really cool. We found that physicians with 20 years of training, expert physicians, when confronted with new information that challenges dogma, and to make a decision about how to treat a hypothetical patient, you put them in the brain scanner and you run this, this experiment, fall into two groups. Group one incorporates the new information to make the decision, and you can see the different pattern of activation of their brain. Group two ignores it and goes on. They're completely different. And interestingly, group one is a group that tries different approaches and fails and keys off of their failures. Group two that stays with the old approach keys off of their successes only. There are different strategies about how we do that, and we want to know if these are types, this is something these people learn, and it will apply outside of the medical field as well, and we hope will enable these people to make better decisions. And then finally, we have a group of people that are turning around the whole way we think about um, being able to do things to our brain that we'd like to to help our brains. And so there's an entire field out there, it sounds a little Orwellian, but there, there are hospitals all over the world that are cutting holes in people's skulls and putting electrodes in their brain to do good things for people whose brains are sick. Parkinson's disease, something called deep brain stimulation. If you've ever been around somebody with Parkinson's and seen their tremor, and they've had these electrodes put in their brain because they don't respond to medication, the tremor stops completely. It's really amazing to watch. That's the good news. The bad news is it's brain surgery. You drill holes in a human being's head. There's all sorts of risks. So we have a group led by this gentleman, Jamie Tyler, who just won a major uh, international innovation award, and he spun off a company that's now working on these products that's turned around the use of ultrasound. So instead of using it just to visualize things, you can use, in Virginia, this is a sensitive term, talking about ultrasound, I know, but we're talking about using this in a, in a therapeutic way and delivering ultrasound particularly to groups of cells in the brain to modulate their electrical activity. And this is being done with children with seizures that are non-responsive, patients with Parkinson's disease, children with something called dystonia, patients with major depression, psychiatric disorders. You just put on this little cap and you can modulate the activity of the cells. So Jamie is taking this to an area to try to put the neurosurgeons out of business to effectively deliver ways that people can help these disorders and also develop this into a company that's using this for a variety of things and employing other people in the area. So we focused on this area of the brain because we think it's important for all of us, not just for Roanoke, obviously. We want Roanoke to be known as the hub, brain central. We brought some of the best minds in the world here. They brought their grants and their money and their energy and their friends. They're having a ball. The community is extremely welcoming. They help us with all these projects. We want to give them ownership. They come into the building. They participate in the studies. And without a doubt, it's uh, the best place uh, I've ever been to do science and discovery. So we hope this is the beginning of a great future, and it's all about this community. Thank you very much.